There are a number of champions of justice reform in Congress, and as we look to possibilities for reform in the future, we're pleased to have one of those leaders uh, with us today, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, who is co-sponsor of the Bipartisan Redeem Act, which I think was just introduced or reintroduced yesterday. Um, uh, here to ask him about that uh, is, as well is, uh, and about criminal justice reform generally, uh, is Bill Keller, the executive editor of the Marshall Project. Um, I will say as a short aside, although I said at the outset that everyone had their uh, bios and we wouldn't say much in the way intro of introductions, that I am uh, thrilled to be welcoming uh, the senator here. Uh, he and I go back uh, some ways uh, uh, from time in on the hard, uh, hard scrabble streets and hallways of Yale Law School together. Uh, I, I, know, I know Corey to be um, a man of great passion and sincerity and conviction, and we are very lucky to not only have him here, uh, just as the people of Newark were lucky to have him lead that city for, for, for many years, but to have him in the Senate and to help us drive to the kinds of solutions that we've been talking about this morning. So, uh, Bill and Corey, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, the theme of this meeting is the path forward, and I think most of the discussion will be about the path forward. But I want to start by talking a little bit about how we got here, um, because this series of meetings was organized around the 20th anniversary of the uh, 94 crime bill, which was Bill Clinton's crime bill and Ted Kennedy's crime bill. So um, I think maybe just to start off, isn't it fair to say that liberals are as much to blame as conservatives for the state of our uh, dysfunctional criminal justice system? Um, the word, he's punching me out of the, out of the blocks here. Um, <laughs> the, 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 to look at this in a uh, sense of blame, I think, it, it doesn't accomplish that much. But yes, the 1994 crime bill, for a lot of people that felt they were doing the right thing by communities, this passed through both houses, it passed with African-American uh, uh, legislators voting for it and supporting it, uh, right and left, um, really was a reaction to what people thought was the times, growing crime. And I think it was dealing with symptoms of problems and not the core root of them. And ultimately, in my opinion, uh, made things a lot worse. A trend that was already bad with the war on drugs just accelerated that. And to put billions of dollars, the biggest crime bill in the history of this country, that sent uh, billions of dollars to, uh, f to the prison system um, and didn't have the kind of investments in things we now know that works, diversion programs all the way to reentry programs, um, to me was a stunning mistake, which is easy for me to say as a guy who in 94 was still in school um, and uh, didn't, uh, now has historical perspective. And what I, encourages me is that a lot of those folks that participated and voted on that, some of my senior colleagues, are now people who are joining in efforts to try to reform the system. Well, one of the reasons I asked about the, the, the liberal role in this is because um, for a number of years, I, I think it was the case that liberals campaigned to be tough on crime because they were afraid of being Willie Horton. They were afraid of being denounced as soft on crime. And the interesting dynamic we have now is a, a growing conservative enthusiasm for a lot of these issues, which, beside from its intrinsic merits, gives cover to liberals who might otherwise have been afraid to campaign on these things. And I guess I'm curious, you, you have not only embraced these issues as a senator, you actually campaigned on them. Yes. Is it safe to campaign for the, on these kinds of issues at, beyond New Jersey? <laughs> um, Yes. Look, I look to the red states now, and I use them often as ways of prodding and encouraging some of my colleagues in the Senate that saying, wait a minute, the Republican leaders at the state level are, are doing things. Texas and Georgia, states that have never been known for being soft on crime, you have these amazing leaders there, like the governor of Georgia, who is visiting black churches and bragging about his record in reducing African-American incarceration in that state by 20%. Uh, and driving down crime at the same way. So there's lots of cover now. And so when you are saying things that are resonating with the Heritage Foundation, we on the way here, we were walking out of the Senate hallways, my staff was sitting in the front, we walked past the general counsel for the Koch brothers and had a, a really great interaction because the Koch brothers are on, on this. So when you get all of these Republicans, Newt Gingrich, Grover Norquist, 
it gives Democrats, yes, it gives us a lot of cover, uh, as well as having the practical examples to point to. But I think that also un, uh, uh, doesn't give short shrift to the voters now. And I think that when you have such a large percentage of the American population who've been incarcerated, uh, a large percentage of people in this room know friends that have been caught up in the criminal justice system. People, I think there's a sense in this country that the system lacks fairness. And I was amazed when I was campaigning and talking about the issue from black churches to uh, largely white suburbs that I would get applause when I would talk about this issue. Mm -hmm. there, there are probably some pretty obvious areas where you're not going to get a, a collaboration of left and right. Guns come to mind, maybe the death penalty, uh, legalization of drugs, but w where are the most fruitful areas? Do you think for left-right cooperation, uh, common ground on these on this Iranian negotiations? I think there's a lot of <laughs> commonality uh, um, <laughs> uh, there. No, um, uh, look, there is um, there are a lot of uh, uh, bills out right now on the on the Senate side from the Cornyn uh, uh, legislation with White House Durbin Lee's. Uh, uh, legislation, mine with Rand, where you're seeing that there's a lot of convergence. And so when Durbin Lee's smarter sentencing bill, front end mandatory minimum reform, gets a wide swath of senators from both sides, from Ted Cruz uh, uh, to uh, Al Franken, um, you, you see that there's a lot of turf. But, but to be honest, there's also people that are saying no to some of these reforms. And those are the folks that we're going to have to figure out if we can work with uh, to, to get something done. And, you know, Chuck Grassley, who I found to be an honorable man uh, uh, of, of uh, integrity and, and, and uh, strong opinion, is somebody that does not believe in the kind of mandatory minimum reforms that are suggested by the smarter sentencing. So he, being the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, has the ability now to sort of stop some of the reforms that have gained bipartisan momentum. Mm -hmm. Are there elements of, the, of these various bills that, in your mind, just seem essential, that, that, that you would be reluctant, even in a great spirit, a rare spirit these days of compromise, that you were, you would be reluctant to compromise? Well, there, so criminal justice reform, it's a wide swath, and I always say it, it goes from policing practices all the way to reentry. It's, it's a wide spectrum. And so my goal is to see reforms across the board, because having been a mayor of a city, I see that every aspect of, uh, of, of this is negatively affecting uh, communities like Newark, Camden, Patterson, Passaic. So I, it's hard for me to say that, um, that if something isn't part of it, then I'm going to reject it. Uh, um, so I'm going to take as much off the table as I can. My worry, though, and I said this, the president, the president had a, a summit in the White House, about 15 legislators from both parties. So you had 15 people there that represent Democrats and Republicans, and it was bicameral. So you had people from both the House and the Senate. So 15 of us, the president was there, the vice president was there, um, uh, uh, high-level people from DOJ, Holder couldn't be there because it's someplace else. So you had the summit meeting with Everybody sitting around the table incredibly serious about getting something done. And uh, in those meetings, being that I am the low man on the totem pole, uh, low person on the totem pole, uh, I am the newest senator around. The, I, I'm so new in the Senate, I still have the new Senate smell. Um, <laughs> and and um, I was kept quiet for the, for the whole meeting, just soaking in the comments of my colleagues. And the president finally turned to me and asked me to say something. And, and my comment to him, going to your question, was, look, this is a historical convergence that on an issue that you don't normally see in America, where uh, less than a generation ago, uh, people were faced in a 100%, in a 180 degrees in a different direction on crime in many ways. Now that we've all swung around, you have right and left coming together. My only criticism in this Congress, um, and disappointment would come, uh, from if we took a small step as opposed to a large leap on this issue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my ambition is not to do an incremental bill that makes a dabble of difference. Uh, I want to see a huge bill that makes a heroic difference. Mm -hmm. difference. Um, and, uh, 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 and that, to me, we're not there yet. We're just not there yet. And that means that folks, and many of you who have shown up today, 
uh, have to uh, uh, get into uh, uh, the, onto the field and help push uh, the, the, the consciousness of my caucus and the Republican caucus uh, to get an appetite for doing something larger than is politically possible today. Isn't there a danger that you could get an omnibus bill that sort of touched all of the bases, but touched them without putting, having any teeth, uh, that was so watered down that Congress would pass it, everybody would declare victory over the criminal justice system and go home? Yeah, well, New Jersey uh, gave me six years. <laughs> and so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, even if we got something big done, even if we got my ambition, I have a, 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 some, a bit of a bill in my mind um, that includes... A, a, a swath of all the bills that are out there, there would, as soon as that's done, before the ink dries and the president signs it in, we all need to go back to working on the things that, that couldn't be a part of that. So I don't think that's a danger if you had something that touched all elements, uh, if it moved the bar significantly. And, and, and some things make a, would make a, it, you, you, shouldn't, uh, um, you shouldn't sell short the big differences that's, that small reform. So let's just take the Redeem Act, for example. Um, this is probably not an appetite for this right now in the Senate, but imagine we got ending uh, solitary confinement, uh, virtually ending solitary confinement for juveniles. It is a horrific practice. Other countries consider that torture. Um, it is, it hurts, it, it scars children. And, and in fact, more than 50% of the suicides of youth in prison are done by youth who are either in solitary confinement or have come out of solitary confinement. Um, that's not enough to reform criminal justice, but damn it, we should do that. Let me give you another something that's really small. Mississippi did this. They realized that if you were an ex-offender, I don't know if you are or not, but if you are an ex-offender um, and you come out of... I'm, I'm an undetected. You're an undetected <laughs> offender, which is, frankly, given the drug laws of our country, most Americans are undetected uh, offenders. The, the last three presidents have admitted to being... Uh, undetected offenders. Uh, uh, they committed felonies, and they all have said so. Um, and uh, that's why it's tragic in this country that we have this criminal justice system that sucks so many people in, but different people from different economic circumstances and different races in different ways. If you're a Latino or black, and if you're Latino and you smoke pot and you're white and smoke pot, the Latino person has twice the chances of being arrested for the police by the person who's black. And so my point is, is that, is that what Mississippi said is when people come out of prison, they often have to, they often violate probation in, in, or parole, in, in, uh, it, not with committing crimes, but sort of status violations, the failure to check in um, uh, uh, with your, with your, with your uh, officer, probation officer, a parole officer, for example. Mm -hmm. And what they do at that point, what they used to do, is just throw the person back in prison mm -hmm. for six months, a year, for whatever the remainder of their sentence was, and that would ratchet up the prison population because it often happened. What they realized is, wait a minute, we can get the same punitive effect by just putting them in for a weekend, mm -hmm. not making them miss their job, uh, taking them away for their kids, but that smack on the wrist of two days in prison, and by the way, uh, um, uh, one day in prison, frankly, would be a pretty motivating experience for me, um, uh, then, then they come out, now you reduce the prison population, save taxpayer dollars, you empower that person to succeed, and you cor take corrective action. That's a small change, but it's dramatically reduced the prison population in Mississippi. So my point is, is it's not enough in Mississippi. I'm sure there's lots of other reforms that need to be made, but let's get something done. Now, the, 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 the thing for me that would disappoint me a lot if we didn't get done would be man changing mandatory minimums in some way in this in this Congress. I, I'll be very, very disappointed. Uh, my staff tells me to be a realist. I haven't been in the Senate long enough to know that how slow things move or appreciate that. But uh, I'm pushing hard to figure out a way to get some kind of sentencing reform done. I think it's, it's critically important and ultimately will make the biggest difference on our mass incarceration problem. That's an issue where Senator Grassley is um uh, against you, and interestingly enough, some Democrats, uh, Chuck Schumer, yes. from my home state, uh, yes. is against reforming mandatory minimums. Yes. Um, Where does the resistance come from to that? Uh, I, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for Chuck Grassley, and, and I want to sit with him and, and understand the contours of his resistance. But I, I did listen to his speech very carefully on the floor, um, uh, where he's just not sure if the cure to the, if, if mandatory minimums really are the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, I 
hopefully get a chance to talk to him about all the data that supports that mandatory minimums seriously for, for nonviolent drug crimes still are a major problem and one of the major drivers. Remember, we have a prison population that's increased 800% in the last, um, uh, the last 30 years, and the major driver to that is nonviolent offenders. And, um, uh, so I think that the, he has very firm beliefs in somebody fueling those beliefs, and I'm hoping that in a, in a conversation we can, with, 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 with real data, we can, we can soften that. And again, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this audience thinking that's nice, naive new senator, because um, this guy has dug in, in a lot, Corey, don't you understand that? Um, but, you know, I just have a lot of faith that facts and uh, knowledge uh, will prevail in this case. I really do believe this is, this is a, ca a cause that whose time has come and that a lot of the resistors will, including Chuck Schumer, frankly, who I think has come around to some mandatory minimum changes, maybe not all the ones that I would want, but has come around to some of them. Um, because I read my Marshall Project morning email this morning, I'm, I know that today you and Senator Gillibrand and Senator Paul are introducing a bill to legalize medical use of marijuana at the federal level. Yes. Do you see that as part and parcel of criminal justice reform? A absolutely. And, and, and this is yet another thing that makes me anguish uh, in my heart. Uh, that we have a nation that has marijuana as a Schedule I drug, which means it has no redeeming purpose whatsoever. Um, it's on the same level of some of the most severe uh, 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 drugs that are out there. And, um, and that there are people in this country who, st scientists and doctors, want to prescribe this uh, marijuana to alleviate extreme suffering of children, extreme suffering of our veterans, um, but folks who are in states where marijuana has been legalized for medical purposes uh, still have a hard time getting it. Um, veterans and veterans hospitals are being denied it. Uh, the uh, uh, bankers won't uh, facilitate them because they're afraid of losing their FDIC uh, insurance. Um, where there's all these impediments in getting sick people the medical medicine that they deserve. So this is just so common sense. So absolutely it's a part of the larger picture of criminal justice reform. But this is clearly an area where the federal government is wrong in where they are now, overstepped their bounds, is fiscally imprudent, and is causing and perpetuating, not causing, but is perpetuating the suffering of a lot of families. How do you assess the chances of that piece of legislation? Um, uh, about the chances that I play for the New York Giants this year. Um, uh, um, uh, um, it, 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 I'm going to push like hell, and um, I think that um, will we get it done in this? Con will Mitch McConnell stand up and put this up, this Congress? Uh, I think it's a long shot. Um, but, you know, look, I was in Selma this weekend, and when I saw Governor Wallace's uh, daughter hugging. Uh, uh, John Lewis, uh, it made me understand that I'm sure, and even they even talked about this, like I, I never dreamed that this day would come. Uh, I, I think time is accelerating. Uh, wh why do I mean that? Because I remember when I raised the pride flag at Newark uh, City Hall for the first time, and I got hate phone calls from, not anonymous hate phone calls, I can take the anonymous ones, but when like, you know, uh, people call you up, and uh, hi, I'm Minister So and So, and you know th that was 2006. And uh, uh, with by the time my term ended as mayor, the last thing I was doing was marrying people in City Hall because the laws changed that quickly. I think that w this is another one of those accelerated moments in history where uh, things like this can change really quickly, mm -hmm. and and a law like the one that we're introducing uh, might actually get done. And so a lot. I, again, I return to everybody's here listening to these issues. Uh, there's an old saying in Washington, you all know, that change doesn't come from Washington, it comes to Washington. And my point is, is the more we all are activists in, in this larger cause of, of sensible, just uh, uh, criminal justice uh, uh, um, laws, uh, the quicker this is going to get done. And so what part of my goal is not just trying to work with my colleagues like I will be today with Senator Gillibrand and Senator Paul, but trying to do everything I can to elevate uh, this cause, and, and I, I mentioned to you right before we came in that um, uh, I'm I'm use social media platforms quite a bit. Uh, um, unlike some of my colleagues, I actually use email too. 
Um, <laughs> um, the, uh, but Facebook and, and Twitter uh, and Instagram, th three of my favorite platforms, when I put out what I was doing, the stories that I've started to hear back from suffering people um, um, who have some diseases, some of them which I can't even pronounce, and have talked about this being the specific drug that alleviates their suffering or that their doctor has said alleviates their suffering or worrying about their children. Um, this is ridiculous that there are narcotics in many of our medicine cabinets right now that are severely worse <laughs> um, uh, than marijuana, uh, that we can have access to those, but for some reason because of archaic laws, marijuana has been singled out for some reason as a drug that is used by about 25% of Americans. I don't know that statistically. My staff is looking at me. I just pulled that data point out, guys. Um, <laughs> It's my experience at Stanford. Um, uh, uh, well, there was more like 50%. Um, um, a significant amount of Americans use marijuana recreationally, but people who need it for medical purposes. You're making your staff really nervous. You I am that. making my staff really nervous. <laughs> yeah. I, by the way, all those emails, you've been hitting the forward button and sending them to Mitch McConnell? Yeah, <laughs> yes, okay. yes, and, and, and the Iranian uh, high council. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> now, now your staff is really yeah, nervous. I'm sorry. I just, I'm still <laughs> dumbfounded by yesterday's events. You know, you've said in the past, and you've said a bit today, uh, that um, reforming the criminal justice system is a project of years, not not months or one session yeah. of Congress. So, um, imagine that Hillary Clinton um, at finally declares officially that she's going to run for president, and she comes to you and says, "I need a really big, bold agenda for 2016 on criminal justice." What would you tell her to put on that agenda? So, I would start with an area where she'd be comfortable supporting police officers. Mm -hmm. And um, it is unfortunate that when it comes to violent crime, uh, uh, it, it's this weird reality in the inner city communities. We have a Virginia Tech every day in America with young people being murdered in this country. And uh, we don't enforce the laws that we have. And so the ATF, for example, is anemic um, and, and I think purposely kept so by, by Congress. So I would start with this robust reinvestment in law enforcement in this country. Uh, cities like mine and Patterson and uh, Trenton have had to lay off police officers uh, because the federal resources aren't there. And so I would just say, you know what, we still have too much crime in this country and we're going to reinvest in law enforcement in a really significant way. But we're going to create also systems of training and accountability so we begin to actually address real facts. It is a fact in this country, for every black person arrested today in America, there'll be 2.5 white people arrested today in America. But the odds of a black person being shot by the police is 21 times more, 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 uh, is more likely to be shot in that interaction than somebody that's white. Mm -hmm. And we need to address, the, we need to have a true conversation in this country to begin to address uh, some of these practices. And I know as a police officer, uh, excuse me, as a man, person that was in charge of a police force, uh, as a mayor, that uh, training, data, data uh, collection is so critical. We partnered with the ACLU, in fact, because uh, we realized this Newark Police Department uh, was uh, pulling people over in a racially biased way. And so we realized that we weren't even keeping the records. So saying we're going to reinvest in law enforcement, we're going to uh, invest in our, our records so we can create transparency, into better transparency into police actions, we're going to do things that are just, to me, common sense that I came around to concluding as a mayor that uh, body cameras protect police officers uh, uh, as much as they do the public. So I would have a, a bold police agenda as part of my criminal justice reform that, in, that included training and accountability uh, to address uh, a lot of the bias problems, but also beefed up uh, law enforcement because please understand we have too much violent crime in this country that we have gun smugglers that run around this country with impunity to laws uh, because the ATF doesn't have the resources to tr track them down and put them in prison where they belong. Are there any things you'd put on her agenda that would, she'd be less comfortable with? Well, as soon as you start talking about race in America, uh, most people get uncomfortable. And uh, uh, as a guy who thinks that uh, 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 police officers are, are heroes, and I've seen things, I, I could relate to so many stories where police officers just did irrational things. Uh, one, of my, one of the stories I tell most often was being with Gary McCarthy, who's now Chicago's police director, but he was with me and, uh, uh, before Rahm Emanuel hired him away from me. And 
he called me up and said, my wife uh, says I should apologize. And I said, tell your wife uh, her apologies accepted. Because <laughs> um, uh, uh, Ram is not quick with apologies. Um, but I'm on the phone with Gary McCarthy during a hostage situation where uh, th there is a uh, child involved and a shooter involved, a person with a gun. And uh, he's, he's telling me, we're, we're talking about how we should handle this, what strategy we should use. And then suddenly gunshots start going off in the house. And he and I, at that point, are not in charge. The officers there are. And I just hear them say, go, go, go. And I'm sitting there, as Gary's describing to me, that as shooting is going on, most of us would run out of the building. Guys, not even knowing what the situation is, charged into that building, into a, a gunfire. Uh, that's who our cops are every day, especially in tough environments. And they should be elevated and respected in our society in that measure. But you cannot get away from the fact um, that we have uh, a bias in our, our criminal justice system and bias in our policing practices. And that needs to be stamped out. It has no place in this society whatsoever. And that makes people feel uncomfortable. And it's created a lot of tension. Uh, you saw it in, in Staten Island uh, uh, with a, a situation there. But the cops I know who, uh, who believe in the integrity of the police force uh, want to do everything they can to make sure they're doing policing in a way that builds community uh, uh, builds community cohesion. And that's why some of these innovators, like David Kennedy, for example, um, uh, who are finding ways to do policing practices that, that, that create a racial reconciliation as, as a strategy to create recon racial reconciliation, are having some of the best success in driving down crime in America right now, driving down violent crime, repairing community fabric, as opposed to many African Americans. And, I, and again, I play part in this because my police force had a bias in its, its pulling over, as we found out from the data. Uh, but many African American, young African Americans feel like they are under a police siege in their own cities because they get pulled over so many times, uh, uh, searched so many times, uh, um, and, and, and disproportionately affected by, by, and treated by police officers. That is unacceptable in this country that you have uh, those kind of biases. So that, makes, that would make Hillary Clinton feel, I imagine, um, uh, 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 feel, uh, I think in a positive way, feel like with a mission. And, I, and I'm hoping that, that she'll uh, talk about that. And in fact, knowing the Clintons, I think they will be courageous enough uh, to talk about those issues. And, and She and might enjoy a chance to say that her husband screwed up with the 94 crime bill. I, <laughs> <laughs> I can't comment on that. Okay. Uh, but I do, I, I've gotten to know both Clintons uh, of in, in, in their post-presidential years. And I have found them two of the best uh, people on racial issues, on having the courage to talk about them. And I think that uh, her coming out on that agenda uh, uh, as one small component, I haven't even gotten, if she was asking me to be her advisor, which uh, she has not, <laughs> um, uh, uh, but I would start with that, policing, and I would go all the way through to common sense reentry, rapid attachment to work. But please know, I would start where she's already started because one of the best ways to prevent crime, to prevent interactions with the police, is to invest in children in the first place. Um, and as Frederick Douglass says, it's easier to build uh, uh, strong children than repair broken men. And uh, one of the best ways to deal with a lot of the issues we're having is to actually empower people to succeed. I know factually when guys come home from prison and you have, you're dealing with thousands of collateral consequences, you can't get a job. You can't get a job at McDonald's even. You can't get housing. You can't get grants to go to college. You can't get uh, 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 business licenses um, to start businesses. Um, um, and you feel like you have basically every door to society is being closed on you. You often feel like you have no other choice but to go back in the uh, uh, narcotics trade, uh, underground narcotics trade. And so th these are all common sense. And I'm hoping, my goal is if we, and I, again, I include the audience, if we can start to elevate the volume on this issue, that there might actually be, for the first time in America, presidential debates where people don't trip over each other to talk about being how tough they are on crime, but where the discussion evolves on both so from both candidates from both parties on ways to lower prison populations, empower people to succeed, and end this awful explosion uh, of American uh, prison population that makes us singular in humanity uh, uh, for having the, the largest uh, incarcerated population in history. I look forward to those debates.
They've flashed a sign that says time is up. Uh, I apologize that we um, conspired to not do questions from the audience because after this, the senator's got to go do a press conference where he's going to be asked over and over again when he smoked pot and how often. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's got to sort of save his, his energy for that. Wait, can, I, can I just give a, a quick uh, uh, commercial? So Vera is um, one of the more e extraordinary organizations that are hosts right now. I found out about them when I was in law school and their innovations at that time uh, inspired me uh, in my early career and, and continue to inspire me now. Uh, the Vera team, many of whom are here right now, are on the cutting edge of finding out what works, uh, both in policy and in practice. And I just want to express my gratitude uh, to the Vera Institute for, for their continuing work. They are light uh, in, in, uh, in this country, a beacon for me of, of hope and possibility. So thank you. Now so they're much. holding up a sign that says, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and hold on, I, one more thank you to, to, uh, to, I just want to say thank you to you. You are uh, an esteemed journalist. You were with the New York Times, um, uh, uh, which has, depending on uh, which, uh, which uh, politician you ask, either a, 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 a notorious reputation or a sterling reputation, but you gave up that vaunted career uh, to do what you're doing now, which is to work uh, uh, for the Marshall Project. And I, 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 when I heard that news, when I read about it in the New York Times at first, uh, it was stunning to me and extraordinary that you would uh, put your journalistic focus on this issue, and I'm grateful for that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much.